Welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Authors Series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages, all currently available online. Our theme for 2021 is Taking Care. We're celebrating different ways we can take care of ourselves and take care of others this year. You can check out our upcoming schedule at wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions to the Q&A function. Books are available through our bookstore, Ampersand Books. I'll put the link in the chat. We're so excited to have Kay Ming Chang with us this evening. First, we'll hear her read, then she'll be in conversation with Kaylin Rich. Kaylin is a queer Korean feminist and the Rochester-based author of Girls Resist, a guide to activism, leadership, and starting a revolution. A direct action organizer, nonprofit leader, and professional speaker, she is the vice president of organizational advancement at Ultraviolet. Kay Bing Chang is a Kundaman Fellow, a Lambda Literary Award finalist, and a 2020 National Book Foundation 5 Under 25 honoree. She is the author of the forthcoming micro chat book, Bone House and Gods of Want, a short story collection from forthcoming from One World Random House in 2022. Her poems have been widely anthologized, including in Best New Poets 2018 and the Pushcart Prize, Best of the Small Presses. The writer Jennifer Sang has said, a worthy heir to Maxine Hong Kingston, Louis Ann Yamanaka, and Jamaica Kincaid. Kay Ming Chang is a woman warrior for the 21st century, part oracle, part witness, and all heart. Kay Ming, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored and excited to get to be here. Great, so I'll start with the reading. Um, I'm going to read possibly two excerpts from the book. Um, this first one is a longer one. And just for a little bit of context, um, this por portion of the book follows a girl narrator who has recently grown a tiger tail. Um, and she meets a girl named Ben um, at her school. And these are kind of the shenanigans <laughs> that they get up to. One afternoon, we ran from our older brothers and their foam pellet guns. They shut off every light in the house, chasing us through the kitchen and into the yard and back into the kitchen, where we rifled the drawers for a knife to threaten them back. Ben's brother had two large hands with fingers that curled naturally, adapted for pulling triggers and professional nose picking. The two boys retreated temporarily to my brother's room, saying that when they came back out, we better be hidden or already dead. There was, nothing, there was nowhere that could fit both our bodies except behind the sofa where we wouldn't last. I kissed her before our deaths, pretended the dark was not man-made, pretended our brother's guns shot real bullets, not jelly-tipped shafts I could catch mid-air. I wanted permanent damage, a war where one side was the other's shadow, one body was the other's blade. We kissed, my tongue serenading her teeth. She put her palm on the back of my neck and I was sweating a dress. My hands honeymooned on her hips. The key around her neck nudged me just below the collarbone but I didn't pull away. Between our chests, the key heated until I thought it would weld itself into a new shape, a hinge between our bodies. Ben's ribs parted against mine, releasing her heart into my hands, a fistful of feathers, my throat a perch for her teeth. Then I heard the sound of our brothers reloading on the other side of the sofa, squinting to separate our bodies from the dark. We kept our eyes closed, her mouth on my shoulder, Tomorrow there would be a bruise, a dark spot on the ball of my shoulder, and I think for a second that my skin was of another species, that I was finally turning into what my tail wanted me to be. But then I'd rem remember yesterday, which was today, which was her mouth making my shoulder lift like a wing. Our brothers took aim, still squinting, unable to tell if there was one body or two. We let them. We were silent when the foam bullets bounced off our thighs and bellies. Ben fell to her side and pretended to bleed out of her mouth, her tongue twitching in the dark like a severed lizard tail. The inside of my mouth felt sore, spoken for. It was a lie, letting them believe we could die, but we did it because it was fun to watch them be sorry later. They mourned us by throwing their pellets one by one down the garbage disposal 
while we rolled over onto our bellies and laughed with all the blood in us. We laughed until we pissed ourselves warm and had to line our underwear with paper towels. I wanted to taste everything native to her. I held her spit in my mouth, wondering if this is what the teacher meant by exchanging bodily fluids. We'd just begun seventh grade sex education, which mostly meant our teacher explained that the adhesive wings of a maxi pad were not literal wings and could not equip us with flight. The teacher told us to develop a platonic relationship with our bodies. On the list of illicit fluids that could be exchanged, bartered, semen, vaginal discharge, blood. But there was nothing about what we'd done. In the animal encyclopedia Ben and I memorized, every hierarchy had a name, every violence a vocabulary. Somewhere there was a name for our exchange in a language that was kept from us. I brought Ben to my backyard where the holes breathed, introducing her to each mouth I'd made with my hands. I invented a role for each hole. This one spits watermelon seeds, I said, pointing at the hole to our right. This one tells secrets, I said, pointing to the hole on her left. I still watered the holes once a week with the backyard hose, as if water alone could heal them. Have you tried feeding them, Ben asked. I said I had, but she said maybe it wasn't the right kind of prey. Maybe they wanted to hunt for themselves. I told her to forget about them the way I had. I'd learned to live around them, to skirt around the borders of their throats without being swallowed. Ben looked at me, a smudge of mud on her nose bridge and said, every hole corresponds to something missing. We just need to find what's gone. Whenever there was something she wanted to solve, she fingered the key around her neck, pretended to unlock her mouth with it. She gripped the pen and key in her teeth and suckled on it, thinking. <clears throat> I slid the key from between her teeth, replaced it with my finger, flinching when I felt her teeth. She looked at me without blinking, her mouth, ho her mouth O symmetrical to the holes. Waiting for her teeth to cleave me, I imagined my finger severed inside her mouth, twirling like a stem. Ben shut her eyes, her breath burning circles on the back of my hand. Her teeth clasped around my knuckle and then released, skimming the skin so lightly it reminded me of the time a wasp landed on my finger and sipped at my sweat. I'd been so afraid of moving, of baiting its sting, that I didn't breathe. Coaxing my finger into a hook, I twisted it slow as a key until she opened for me. The next day, Ben thanked me for showing her the holes in my yard and said there was something she still hadn't shown me yet. It was taco day at school and we both poured the ground beef out of their neon shells and down our pants, laughing as the minced meat sagged our underwear. We ran up to the lunch chaperones and said we'd pooped ourselves, flashing our meat stains. They panicked, and they panicked and escorted us to the bathroom, excused us from our next class and left us together while they scoured the lost and found for clean pants. When they left, Ben pushed me into the bathroom stall and told me to sit down and wait. I squatted on the toilet seat until she returned carrying her birdcage. She tugged me out of the stall by my wrist. In front of the finger smeared mirror, she lifted the birdcage with both hands. The mirror above the sink reflected the birdcage between us, fluorescent light flattening our faces. I was too busy watching Ben's face in the mirror to see it, a shape in the center of the birdcage, a shadow without a body. The shadow was standing on the perch in the center, moving in a familiar rhythm, slight and fast and song-like, a bird. When it opened its wings, I turned my head from the mirror to look up at the ceiling to see what bird was casting its shadow down, down on the cage. But there was no body, just the bird shadow, and I could see only its reflection. I looked at the cage directly, then at its image, trying to align them in my mind. But the cage in the mirror carried more. Ben guessed the shadow bird was some kind of ghost, left behind by a bird that had died in it. I told her I was always suspicious of shadows. Mine left me at night to grow its own body. I looked at the shadow bird again in the mirror, trying to imagine a pigeon or a sparrow, but I decided its species was its own. Ben says she tried installing bird feeders and bottle caps full of water, but the shadow bird didn't hunger or thirst or grow and never tried to leave. For the rest of the hour, while our classmates dissolved in the heat outside, we stood side by side, not facing each other, just watching the shadow bird in the mirror, not naming it either. Though in my mind, I had already, I had already given it many names, mouth with wings, night in a body. 
setting the cage down in the sink, Ben turned on the faucet and the water gathered black at the bottom of the cage. I turned to Ben and looked her in the mouth, said I had something to show her too. It was something I couldn't name either. It was the sum of my body and its predecessors. Ben let the water run out of words. I pulled her by the wrist back into the stall and turned, turned around, sloughing off my pants. Silent, Ben reached down, touched the knotted tip of my tail as if it were a bird that would startle, lifted it to her nose and stroked it once across her face, as if she could tell its species by scent. What is it? I asked her. Ben dropped my tail, watched it hang, teethed her, pen her pendant key. Tigers are natural predators, Ben said. When I asked how she defined a predator, she said something that eats other things for a living. But wasn't that everything? Ben said I should look at the food chain, but the only chain I'd memorized was the pendant string around her neck. I lived inside its radius. Cats and birds are natural enemies, Ben said, pointing at me and then herself. Do you mean we're enemies? Shaking her head, she said, we were many species, many bodies. But what am I becoming, I said. I wondered if she'd ever feared I'd hurt her if she knew how I'd once tried hunting my father. If I ate her someday, she had to forgive me. Ben said she couldn't forgive anyone if she didn't have a body. Can bodies cross into other bodies? Ben said I was always asking the wrong questions. I told her I knew about evolution and finches, knew all the concepts we were taught. But she said my tail wasn't shaped like a line. It was shaped like a life, circling itself growing backward from tip to root. The sinks outside were overflowing, flooding us to the ankles, water rings coiling like snakes. Ben said it didn't take generations to change, to adapt to a new predator or environment. Sometimes one body could do it. She talked like a scientist of survival. I told her there was no evolutionary line between tigers and people, and if there was, it still meant I was moving backward. There's no such thing as forward or backward, she said, her finger circling in the air. There was no such thing as progress, just accumulation. A long time ago, she told me, when a man died of exhaustion while building the Great Wall, the man behind him just bricked his body into the wall and kept going. That's why it's studded with skulls, she said, why it's shaped like a spine. It's a burial ground, not a building. I asked her if this story was meant to comfort me. She told me not to worry. We're not alive. We're just between deaths right now. She laughed and reached around for my tail. It thrummed like an antenna, broadcasting her touch all over my body. If we stayed in here, she said, and the water kept outgrowing us, what do you think would happen? I told her we'd drown, but Ben said I was wrong. We'd grow gills, she said. Holding open the stall door, she walked me to the sinks, water receding around us. It listened to her feet when she told it to leave. She turned off the faucet, her cage bobbing in the sink. The pendant key punctured the center of her chest, punctuated the center of her chest. Lifting the cage with both hands, she offered it to me. If she unlocked it, I wondered, would the shadow bird leave? Would we see it flee? Ben said she'd let me hold the cage if I let her see my tail whenever she wanted. When I asked her why, she said, I like what it does to my hand. It behaves like it's befriended something wild. I said she could steal it from me anytime. In her hands, my tail was potential, a hilt waiting to be drawn from me. Later, when we were in the classroom closet for our timeout, having flooded the bathroom and cut PE, I whispered to Ben in the dark that I might still eat her someday. Her laughter lit the dark between us, torched it to ash. When I told her to stop laughing that it could really happen, Ben said I shouldn't be afraid of what the tail wanted me to be. You're becoming the species that will save you but neither of us knew what I needed to be saved from. Neither of us knew what a beast was born to do. So that's the first excerpt. <laughs> um, that's in the end of the chapter. Um, I will now read uh, another small excerpt from actually my favorite part of the book, which is um, a pirate story, a story of two pirates, um, kind of part love story, kind of a heist, weird birth story um, that the grandmother tells to the narrator. So this is Parable of the Pirate, Amma's Interlude. To be read in Amma's voice. Suggestions, read this aloud underwater or speak perpendicular to a strong wind or swallow a fork before speaking. Lead your voice of its language, then learn a sea's accent. And again, in the grandmother's voice this time. 
You tell the story like a white person, too much language. I prefer concision, a story with scissor blades, useful for what it can sever. Let's say your great-great-grandfather stole his name before empires and before men and before my hips began barking at me to sit down, back when blood was sweet, we lived in houses underground. We dug into the mountain soil that was so wet you could wring rivers from it. Our doors were holes. We came home by climbing down ladders. If home is beneath your feet, it means you're always home. We planted our shit in the ground to grow more mountains when we ran out. We didn't aspire upward, but downward. The deeper your house, the safer you were from sight, from soldiers, from grief engineered by armies. You think you dig holes in the yard because it's your idea? Digging is the design of your body. Holes are what marrow is made of. The empire had two categories for us, cooked and raw. If you married a mainlander and let them stew their children inside you, you were cooked. If you lived in the mountains and fucked rivers, you were raw. Grandfather Esau was yoke raw. He hard boiled the whites of his eyes by looking directly at the sun and shooting it down. One day, men came up the mountain with pots ready to boil all the boys in the tribe. Esau volunteered to boil himself alive and go down the mountain to seek adventure. He fathered a dozen half raw, half cooked daughters. He fried you a family. He went to sea on a boat he'd stolen from a fisherman, cut the man's throat and speared him in the water. The blood summoned a shark which swam off with the fisherman's balls in its mouth. He lived as a fisherman until his boat was boarded by a fleet of pirates. My grandfather did not mind being a pirate. He liked it better than fishing and anything was better than being on land where everyone was trying to cook him. The pirates called him Three Blades. And yes, of course he carried three blades, all of them different lengths, all of them named after snakes, until he killed his first merchant. Esau took that merchant's name because he liked to collect names the way other men collected wives and because it would help him pass for Chinese. Now all the pirates called him Old Guang. Back on land, my grandmother thought he'd capsized and died and soon resigned herself to widowhood. She never minded it really. She didn't love her husband any more than she loved having fungus between her toes. My aunts and uncles didn't miss him either. Old Guang was just a fart that infiltrated the house. Before he was kidnapped, we saw him only once a moon. The captain of this pirate fleet was a Tonka man named Ah Zhen, younger than, my great, younger than my grandfather, but taller, slender as a dagger. From afar, his ship looked like a mouth. The wood was sun-dyed white as a jawbone, and along the railing of the ship, he'd embedded stakes of ivory that looked like teeth from a distance. The ivory stakes were a form of defense against being boarded. Most of Ajin's people had been slaughtered by the Cantonese and piracy was vengeance. If the Cantonese called him unfit for land life, he would wield the water as a whip. He would capture all their ships, weld their holes, melt their foreign gold and gild all his teeth in it. All his life, the shore was a father. He knew he would never be allowed to meet it. Fine by him, he preferred water to women. He had been conceived and born at sea. Some say he could sing to fish, that they threw themselves into the boat whenever he was hungry. Some say his balls were big enough to shoot out of cannons. The other pirates all said his ship was powered solely by flatulence, that he stood at the prow and farted a wind that blew him anywhere in the world. They say his ship was armed with sharks swimming always beneath him, and that was why he'd never lost a battle. In two weeks, he'd won so much loot, his entire fleet began to sink with the weight of all that shine. Now they stored their bounty in seaside cliffs, branding treasure maps into one another's backs. Ajeng's feet had never felt land, and the idea of living with his feet locked to the earth, that shit-colored filth, made him physically ill. The sea, on the other hand, was his glittering garment. He was so blessed, even the storms bounced off his boat. Ajeng resembled an ordinary hog on land, but was handsome on water, especially reflected off a surface. He wore the, ha the hat of a tonka, but underneath his hair was like water, stroking his shoulders or coiling on its own. He was born with a blowhole on the top of his head that he liked to stick a miniature flag inside, a flag that was just a piece of toilet paper. His eyes were the color of bitter grapes. Always remember to spit out the grape skins or you'll get eyes like that too. All see. You'll see everything dark as light, everything loved as lost. All this to say, Old Guang, my beef-hearted, fish-dicked, hog-spawned grandfather, fell in love with Ah Jin. 
So that's the end of that little excerpt. Obviously the pirate story goes on and they have a whole adventure at sea, but I'll just end the excerpt there. Um, thank you so much for, for listening to my read, listening to me read. <laughs> Thank you, Kaming. That was fantastic. I was saying before we started that I was very much looking forward to hearing the words like in your in your voice because as I was reading it, I kind of constructed my own vision of who these characters were, and it was it was lovely. I also know you are a poet, which comes clear so clear in your writing, and um, yeah, you're a great reader too. And I just, I really enjoyed listening to that. I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone when I say that. So um, for the audience, you can go ahead, if you have not already, feel free to submit questions through the question box. You can also just post them in the chat. Uh, I'll be on the lookout for your questions if you have any. And um, I have a few myself, so we'll start there. And if people right. have questions, feel free to, to jump in. So again, everybody, hi, I'm Kaylin Rich. Uh, I'm the author of Girls Resist. I am also a, a queer Korean American uh, child of the Asian diaspora. And, I'm excited to be in conversation with someone who I share so much with. Um, Kaming, I read that, uh, and actually, then this book has been getting just like accolades all over. So if you've not picked it up, you really need to get it uh, to stay ahead of the times. Uh, it's been reviewed everywhere. So I read in the, the Wall Street Journal review that um, one of the origins of this story for you was actually a story you wrote when you were in elementary school. Can you tell me a little more about that? And like, how old were you? kind of how long have you been carrying the story with you or how did you find your way back to it? Yeah, I love this question. So in elementary school, I was a really intense like journal writer. Um, I had a notebook with me um, where I just eavesdropped on people <laughs> and also blatantly lied all the time in this journal, which is so funny because I was the only one who was ever going to read that. So I'd go back and read these entries and I'm like, these are all lies and who are you lying to? <laughs> There's no one else reading this. It'll be like super top secret. No one can ever know this. And it would just be like, I, you know, saw a unicorn. I cut off its, you know, it's, it was so wild to read the, these extremely inventive uh, revised uh, life stories. Um, and in that journal, I'd begun to kind of serially um, give installments <laughs> of this story of a girl um, who survives um, a car accident in which she like fell off a cliff, super dramatic. I'm sure I saw that in a movie or something like that. And she wakes up really dramatically um, and she ends up in um, a very like kind of fantasy uh, school where she grows a tiger tail and all of her other friends are animals <laughs> as well. And it became this like long epic. Um, and then eventually I decided that she could also fly <laughs> um, because I, I decided that that was the twist that the story needed to take. But I think what's really interesting about those original stories is that um, one, I was really interested in this image of the tiger daughter. Um, especially because like growing up, um, the idea of like a, a girl born the year of the tiger was like, oh, she's bad luck. It's, it's not a good omen. And I was really interesting, interested in reinventing um, that story or that omen. Uh, what does it mean to carry so much um, and to also subvert expectations? Um, and it also was this like imaginative secret space that I had. Um, where I got to invent and lie <laughs> um, and have this space of fantasy that I think is so important for like young queer life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. That's really interesting. And I feel like if you were want to sell the rights to the animal school version of it, <laughs> to like Netflix for kids, somebody wants to produce that. Uh, <laughs> you touched on something I think is really interesting which is, you know, obviously, um, even if you have not read the, the book yet, I think it's obvious from the, the reading that you did that um, folklore, storytelling, sort of using stories to fill the gaps in our own histories, in our ancestors' histories, is very much a, pe a like a, a very core part of this, of this book. Um, you know, I think I said I'm a Korean adoptee. I consider myself prior to the diaspora. Found a lot of myself in these characters, especially daughter including my own desire, right? Part of my entrance into writing, it sounds like yours too, was like filling in the gaps um, with my own fantasies, <laughs> creating like adventure out of, out of things that were otherwise, um, honestly, like a little bit traumatic, right? Or maybe a lot of bit traumatic. So can you tell me about the story? And if you haven't read the book yet, I apologize for the spoilers, but you'll figure it out pretty quickly. Could you tell me a little bit about the, the Hugupo folklore 
and which is a tale sort of like of transfiguration and transmuting the body and also hunger for the flesh of children in its like original forms. But um, I think that hunger stands for a lot of things in this book. But tell me about how that tie, you, you hinted at this, but how it ties into sort of your specific like queer Asian American identity, which is also something a lot of us out in the world share. Yeah, I mean, I love this question because I have been kind of obsessed with this. It's a children, it's a story for children, which I find hilarious because it's all about eating children. It's absolutely horrifying. And I love the idea of, of telling children um, this kind of body horror-esque story. I um, mean, I grew up hearing it and kind of pestering uh, my mom to tell it to me. Um, and I think something that really fascinated me that as I grew older, when I look back on it retrospectively, I was really interested in exploring is this idea that um, which I didn't know because it wasn't part of the story when I heard it. I'd heard it as, oh, Hukupo is this kind of tiger woman um, who has this villainous uh, homicidal hunger. And what I later learned is that the reason why she had that hunger was because she was a tiger spirit who desperately wanted to be in a woman's body. And in order to have that body, she had to commit these acts of violence and feed it in order to remain inside of that body. So the story kind of transformed for me um, and made me think about, oh, what does that say about um, what it means to be a quote unquote good woman or a good mother or to lack certain maternal desires? Um, and what does it mean that the cost of having her body is this hunger that she has to continually feed? I um, mean, I was really interested in exploring that in relation to things like intergenerational violence, um, inheriting hunger and what it means to carry a hunger that has not been sated for many, many generations. Um, and I was also interested in how so many fables of Chinese or Taiwanese fables, the anytime someone is kind of outside of acceptable society, they're an animal. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, that woman is acting so strange. She's like eating men's like bodily fluids. She's a fox. <laughs> Or, oh my God, this, this woman tricked this man into marrying her and she's a snake. Oh, we saw all saw her transform into this snake. Um, so I was really interested in what it means to other those bodies and, be, and to say that they're not human, that they're beasts or freaks or these creatures. Um, and I wanted to instead kind of, I don't know, see that as a kind of power um, and a kind of hybridity and a fluidity um, in a rearranging of hierarchies rather than as, you know, kind of feeding into like, oh, what, what it, does it mean to be in an acceptable body, to be in a correct um, body that could interact with others versus these like strange animal women <laughs> um, who are like eating people and doing all of these things that we can't control and can't be married and all these things. And I thought there was so much to tap into um, and to channel in a different way. Yeah. I love you that. Thank you for it. I love you. Oh my, but <laughs> really feeling emotional, yeah. I guess. Um, I love that answer. And it makes me think a lot about, uh, so I have a kid myself who, and we're at that age where like media consumption is a thing. And growing up, I always identified more with the villains than the heroines of things. And I think in later in life, I was like, oh, that was my like otherness, my like queerness speaking mm -hmm. through my like inability to like fully feel embraced by the white culture it was all around me growing up all of those things um and then there's this whole like area like you know around like, like queer monsters are a thing and I think in, in every culture or monsters that are coded as queer like childless dangerous man-eating <laughs> so I, I just I felt a, a lot of a lot of affinity for Kukupo um we have a question and it is Kaming which authors influenced you as a very young writer and as an adult author Oh, this is such an interesting question. Um, I think as a, when I was still in my journal writing, uh, <laughs> uh, writing these like very embellished entries, um, I was really inspired by books like, uh, like Little House on the Prairie, that entire series. And obviously now looking back on those books, I kind of see them in a new critical light of, especially the way that they are writing about indigenous people. Um, but I think what was really interesting about those books is that they contained a lot of rural knowledge um, that kind of aligned with a lot of stories I'd grown up hearing about. Um, and I'd always wondered like, oh, what do I do with all of the, this kind of knowledge that I have inherited about like eating, like slaughtering ducks for, raising ducks for slaughter, you know, <laughs> like all of this knowledge and all of a very, like an intimacy with environment and land um, that I really wasn't sure where to put um, kind of growing up in my more like urban environment. 
and that eventually got channeled into a lot of my writing, um, which I think does try to engage a lot with um, land as a living thing um, and the natural environment in a lot of ways. Um, and then as an adult author, I think books like Marilyn Chin's Revenge of the Mooncake Vixen was so transformative for me because it was like fabulous and it was kind of crude and uh, magical um, and irreverent uh, and was writing about girlhoods in a way that I recognized and loved and gravitated toward. Um, and of course, I have an epigraph from Maxine Hunkinson um, in this book that's called uh, that just just um, says there's a lot of detailed doubt here. Um, which I love so much because I'm like, oh, that's all writing. It's detailed doubt. <laughs> um, and so Maxine Hunkingston, also hugely influential for me. And so many other books, I think coming of age stories, I'm always really interested in, um, both in writing toward those tropes and also subverting them. And so I really love books like We the Animals um, by Justin Torres or Sour Heart by Jenny Zhang. Um, so a plethora. And also maybe kind of the dark horse in this is Wuthering Heights. <laughs> um, has inspired me hugely. I just, every single time I read it, I'm like, there's something very Asian about this book. And I can never quite put my finger on what it was. And then I realized, oh, this is like an intergenerational story. <laughs> um, it's really, it's not just about a oh, one singular love story. It's about generations of trauma and also love. Um, and it has this kind of strange reincarnation aspect to it, <laughs> to all the characters. And it's also a ghost story. So to me, when I read it, I'm like, there's something so recognizable about Wuthering Heights. And I don't know what quite what it is, but um, I'm very drawn to it. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, so like kind of related to that, actually, I was, there's very few times in my life when I have felt like I can find things that really like reflect me where I'm not. And one of the things you talked about was sort of relating you yourself to some stories that looking back, you're like, okay, this wasn't really, really for me, or it had mm -hmm. some um, maybe confusing or upsetting messages. <laughs> center whiteness in a certain way and, and other otherness in a certain way. So um you're probably familiar with um we need diverse diverse books and their whole thing about which is based on this we don't talk about it, it's academic but this like 1990 article about windows mm -hmm. windows and uh, mirrors and sliding yeah. glass doors but the idea that for those of us especially um people of marginalized identities we're often forced to look through the the windows <laughs> and try to like make sense of the dominant narrative whether that's in history class but especially in our like literature and see ourselves in it because we're not really in it versus like actually like by us representation where we see ourselves reflected or even better have a slight door are able to like pass through into the world because it's it's our world it's not us trying to like look through a window into someone else's world and make it ours um so i'm curious i would love to hear related to like your your favorite books like what is do you can you if you can even answer this question um when was your first experience with representation that felt like authentic to you where you felt like you were looking more like in a mirror or in a sliding door in literature or in media if literature is too because there's there's so little oh that is such an interesting question I think a lot of what uh, a lot of the stories that kind of really lived in me for so long were oral stories um things that I couldn't find physical representations of in any way, or I couldn't necessarily find in text form. Um, and I would kind of try, it was like trying to invent a language for it. And as I was writing, it was like trying to, I don't know, feel my way <laughs> through this hallway of not quite having the language for it. Um, but interestingly, a lot of the media that I gravitated toward um, that I ended up finding these, these pieces of were things that I think were not meant for me, which is really interesting. And I think that's part of the inventiveness <laughs> of my child self um, is being able to kind of parse out these threads that I was like, I wanna carry these. Um, and this is not a book, but as a kid, I was really obsessed with the sitcom Frasier, <laughs> which is really very not about, <laughs> you know, um, like young Asian women or anything like that. It's about, you know, like an upper middle class, middle aged um, white man and his family. But I think what I was so drawn to and that I, I still return to 
um, again, is that inter intergenerational story aspect mm -hmm. that kind of distilled. It's a, it's a story about a man taking care of his, an adult man taking care of his aging father, which again mm -hmm. is a very Asian thing that I, that <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I'm seeing it on TV and it's this family. And for them, it's like so unconventional and weird. They're like, oh my God, can't believe my dad has to live with me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, these like systems of intergenerational care for me, those stories have always been um, what I grew out of. And so um, it was really interesting um, to see that, <laughs> to see that on screen and to see those very complex um, intergenerational dynamics and relationships on screen. Um, and then later I was writing so many stories of, you know, taking care of elders or being in relationships where like the grandparents are raising the kids and these kind of non-nuclear families. Um, Cause I feel like usually sitcoms are like, it's about the nuclear family. Um, and I really liked that this sitcom was not quite that. And um, that ended up coming out a lot in my, in my storytelling. So that was a very strange thing that happened. <laughs> um, but that I, I now look back on and I'm like, okay, I can kind of understand like where, um, yeah, where that obsession with these kinds of stories comes from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to watch Frasier too, and I'd never considered it in that yeah. context. <laughs> Uh, so let's see, we have another question here. I'm gonna, oh, and um, Allison, who asked the last question, says also the other in Wuthering Heights. Yeah, for sure. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so we have a question here from Luca it's, uh, for both of us, I guess. Cayman and Kaylin, I don't know if you feel this absence, but I'm still mourning the cancellation of the WNYC podcast, Nancy. Oh, yeah. Hosted by two Gaijin best friends. In addition to Beast Jerry, do you recommend any <laughs> Gaijin content or like queer Asian content out there helping to fill the void? Oh, I mean, I have one recommendation is I really love uh, the poet Chen Chen's book. Um, when I grow up, I want to be a list of further possibilities. Mm. Um, I think that it's so delightful. I think Chen Chen writes with um, just like incredible breath and everything that he does with language opens up new possibilities for me. Um, so that's one thing I, I really love. Yeah. I like thinking and trying and kind of drawing a blank. Um, it's hard to it's hard to think of things off the top of our heads. I'm sure afterwards we'll like think of ten other things. Um, oh, I just thought of one thing. Um, I really love uh, these are books, so I'm not sure if I have any podcast uh, recommendations. I would I would love I would welcome podcast recommendations yes. personally for myself. Um, but I also really love the Taiwanese writer Chiu Miao Jing, um, mm. who is uh, no longer alive, but um, yeah, her books are incredible. She has two books. One is like a book of letters um, that can be read in any order. That's a novel. And the other one is called Notes of a Crocodile. Um, and yeah, I, I'm not going to say anything, but let's just say they're intense. <laughs> <laughs> really intense in a good way. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I appreciate that. And I'm going to like write that. I'm writing that down myself. <laughs> Type it over here. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, like my... um answer to that is that there just like isn't enough quite frankly like I can think of some movies and things but I don't know it's not like the best representation it's not nearly enough I mean I think one of the things that struck me about Beast Jerry just personally is I did grow up with sort of that window view of the world where I kind of had to find ways to place myself into stories right mm -hmm. um and only recently I've been able to find authors that that speak to me in this way yourself included um mm -hmm. One thing that I really appreciated about your writing of like Asian womanhood was that the whitewashed version of that and the the sort of story we get fed is the sort of like Mulan version of that where it's like very delicate, very passive, and that's in juxtaposition to the things we consider masculine, like violence and um, dominance, et cetera. And whereas you know in in bestiary, I mean obviously there's an animal aspect to all of the women across the generations and they're they're sometimes hard and they're sometimes violent and they're definitely hungry and they are like surviving mm -hmm. and um like growing and nurturing in their own way to their predators uh yeah so i i that that spoke to me a lot um do you what do you hope readers of your book that are queer and asian who are looking for this kind of representation and knowing there just isn't that much what do you hope they um find in bestiary? Wow, that is such a wonderful question. I think for me, I had to, in writing this book, I, I felt like I had to ask permission in a lot of ways. 
And again, it was that feeling, like I was saying before, of like mm. trying to invent a language for something I didn't have a language for, which ended up in the book. Um, like there's that line that I read earlier about, um, there was a name for our exchange in a language that was kept from us of, mm. I feel like these this young protagonist is trying to articulate something um, and it feels like it's coming out of nothing. It comes out of no history and no future and no present. Um, and what I wanted to do in this book is to build that kind of speculative history of um, these ancestors who could have existed um, kind of out of my own desire to feel less lonely, but in a broader sense of what it means to reimagine your own history um, and to kind of bring the speculative eye, not only to futures and presents, but to the past as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. I'm um, sort of shifting gears a little bit. I think one of the things that somebody noticed this in the, oh, somebody put a podcast recommendation in the chat. So we'll just save oh, that. Nice. Somebody <laughs> noticed this as we're doing the reading, but your use of like symbolism and imagery beyond even like the inclusion of sort of story and magic and folklore, your writing, you can tell you are a poet, or at least I can tell <laughs> <laughs> you are a poet. Uh, it really shines through in the way that your lines are so surprising and also somehow really cutting <laughs> and light and like moving quickly. Um, actually kind of like a kite, right? Which if, if, if and when you read the book, it feels very much like that, like this sort of like cutting, slicing through, but and, but also very, very light, very airy. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your craft? I know you write both prose and poetry. Um, and I definitely like feel that like lyricism in your writing. Do you find that those different styles of writing inform each other or? Like kind of like, what came to you first? You were a poet or a, a fiction yeah. writer? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, for for a while thought, I was like, oh, I'm only ever going to write poetry. Because I was I was like, I'm interested in, in language. Um, and I really love how in poetry, there's so much kind of unconventional use of language and that there aren't these rules surrounding it. Um, obviously, there are forms that you can follow and schemes and all these things, but it felt so freeing. And I felt like poetry was the thing that gave me that permission to write this and to explore and to invent new languages and not have to be think about being grammatical and not having to think about plot or character, or any of those things, just allowing the language to lead me and allowing myself to break forms um, or to invent a new form in a lot of ways, um, which I was kind of playing around with throughout the book. So I definitely think, yeah, poetry like liberated my writing in a lot of ways. And um, even when I'm working on a sentence level, I think I, I definitely still have that, um, I don't know, tendency to really focus um, on the sonics of the language um, and not always thinking about logical meaning first, which can often lead me very astray, as I tell people often, like sometimes it leads me like straight out the window to this other place that I'm just confused by, um, but sometimes it can lead me um, to really surprising places. I really love that you use the word surprising because I I always kind of aspire to, what I love about poetry is the surprising language. And um, I, I always try to write towards that sense of surprise. Um, and when I achieve that for myself on the page, I'm like, okay, I can keep going. <laughs> yeah. I love that. That resonates with me a lot. I actually studied um, poetry in college and then ended up writing nonfiction, which is like yeah, exactly. how I ended up on that path. I don't know. <laughs> I but I, I felt it so much in your writing. Like the poetry is really there. Um, okay, so final question. <laughs> what do you love about this book and what makes it special to you? Oh, I love this question because I'm so used to being so mean to my work. <laughs> it's actually really difficult. I feel like these getting to speak to people about is like the only time I am actually nice to it. Otherwise, I'm like constantly in private, secretly very mean <laughs> to my work and to my book. Um, I think I, I think one of the fears that I had was that people would see it as ethnography or autobiography, that they wouldn't see that there's imagination in it or that it came out of a very imaginative space that um, now I have like trouble even tapping into. Um, but yeah, I, I think now when I do look back on it, I'm like, wow, there's just so much going on. Like the maximal maximalism of it, I find really interesting and, um, I'm like, oh, keep that spirit, <laughs> okay, past gaming, like hold on to that sense of abundance um, and maximalism in the writing. Um, and it just like overgrown in a lot of ways, which I love that feeling. Um, and also how centered it is on these girl narrators um, and how I think it's trying to 
I don't know, push up against a certain patriarchal um, lineage of storytelling um, that I always found to be very kind of disruptive and silencing. Yeah. Oh, I love the answer. I wish we had more time. So I'm really enjoying the time speaking to you. No um, but that is all we have time for today. So I'm going to uh, bring Dan's, I think I'm, we're going to bring back Dan thank to close us so out. Much. But thank you so much, K Ming. I really enjoyed it. And I hope we get to do it again. Yeah. Thank you so much for your incredible questions. It's, they're so thoughtful and wonderful and imaginative. And I don't know. Thank you. I just really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you so much uh, to both of you. Uh, this was such a wonderful conversation and, and reading. Um, buy their books, the link's in the chat. Uh, I want to bring up our funders and uh, thank them. Um, you can uh, catch up with uh, previous readings uh, on our website, wab.org. This one will be up online uh, by next week. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for coming and have a great evening. Thank you.